Hello, welcome to Denton's Tales of Wonderful Things, in which I try to bring, well, things that are amusing, interesting, historical, funny, or unusual. And under the heading of unusual, I doubt really there would be anything that would be more unusual than gay astronomy. Yes, gay astronomy. Every year during the month of June, gay communities around the world celebrate various gay pride events. But I doubt very much that when you see the so-called freedom flag with its striking rainbow design flying at various gay rights events, such as the, the annual gay pride march, that astronomy would be the first thing that comes to mind. So this video on the subject of gay-related uh, astronomy will probably be quite a surprise to you. Gay astronomy, I hear you say? Well, I, I, I've never even heard of such a thing. No, you haven't, and with good reason. You see, that aspect has always been ignored by astronomy magazines, books, or TV shows. I, I have never, for example, seen the correct mythological story of Aquila the Eagle, or what, what Ganymede was really doing up there on, on Mount Olympus with Zeus, given in, in any astronomy book or magazine, save for my own writings on the constellations in Astronomy and Space magazine. And that magazine, and my article in it, without blowing my own trumpet, which of course modesty would prevent me from doing, now what the hell, I'm going to blow it anyway. That became the first astronomy magazine in the world, as far as I know, to publish an article on gay astronomy, on which this video is based. Since we did try to fill the gaps, if you like, left by other publications whenever possible. And the correct facts that relate to the gay aspects of astronomy are a very big gap indeed. See, magazines and, and TV programs tended to do what they probably saw as not sanitizing the actual facts, making them making them a little more acceptable for what they saw as public uh, consumption. Uh, the the original Greek versions of many of the constellations, for example, were seen as you no know, not quite nice for for the general public. You know, the why is is rather hard to understand since homosexuality is generally accepted these days as being perfectly normal. It, it is simply one aspect of the very wide spectrum of, of human sexuality. Astronomy isn't as straight as you think. Not that you've probably ever actually thought about it, at least in the uh, mythological and, and historical connections. So what are the gay connections with astronomy? In Greek mythology, there were nine minor goddesses, and they were called muses. And one of these, Urania, was the muse of astronomy. Her name was later used to refer to anything connected with it, in fact. For example, Johann Bayer's star catalogue of 1603 was entitled Uranometria, or Johannes Hevelke's Uranographica in uh, 1690. And, and the great 16th century Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe called his observatory the Uraniborg. But, let's see, Urania, she had another role, for she was also the protector of homosexual love. Or, or the, the, the concept, at least, of a person loving someone of their own sex. Because the modern word homosexual, well, that wasn't used until 1869. And, of course, that would have meant absolutely nothing to an ancient Greek. They, they wouldn't have known what you were talking about. And because of the amuses uh, role in Greek mythology during the 19th century, the word Uranian was widely used to describe homosexuals, giving us yet another connection with the muse of astronomy. Jupiter is the largest planet of our solar system. It's an, an, an enormous gas planet. You could put the Earth into it a thousand times over with room to spare. And it, it's surrounded by a considerable number of moons, the four largest of which, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, were discovered in 1610 by Galileo using the then newly invented telescope, and they are known, for that reason, as the Galilean moons. Now, they're easily visible with binoculars as four little star-like objects, and from night to night you can actually see them moving around the planet. The, the planet-sized Ganymede is the largest of that uh, quartet. In Greek mythology, the bisexual king of the gods, Zeus, fell in love with Ganymedes. He, now, he, he was a young man of great physical beauty, being a, a Phrygian shepherd boy in some versions of the tale, and a prince, the son of King Tros of Phrygia in others, take your pick. 
As it happened, Zeus was in need of a cupbearer at the time, since the former holder of that job, Hebe, had tripped and fallen while performing her duties, and having a few cups of golden nectar dumped over him didn't do a whole lot for Zeus. I mean, he was a bit grumpy, even at the best of times, and inclined to chuck thunderbolts at people. And he decided to combine business with pleasure and offer the job to the handsome young man who had just caught his divine eye, sending his messenger, a giant eagle, to carry Ganymedes to Olympus. Now, young Ganymedes saw this as a pretty good career move. Barman to the gods, live in, all expenses paid on Mount Olympus, plus a great French benefit, lover to the king of the gods. Well, you couldn't ask for more than that, could you? So he took the offered employment. Or who wouldn't? Not, not that he really had much choice, of course. The eagle of Zeus didn't really take no for an answer. It was, right, lad, you're coming with me, and off we go to Mount Olympus. Zeus was so pleased with his young lover that he declared the eagle that had brought him to Olympus to be the greatest of birds, placing it in the heavens as a reward for its homosexual matchmaking services, where it became the constellation known to the Greeks as Atos, the eagle, and to the Romans as Ganymedes Raptrix, the huntress of Ganymedes, which we know today as the constellation of Aquila the eagle. So all this gives us a gay moon, and since Jupiter is the Roman name for Zeus, we also have a bisexual planet with the king of the gods, mighty Jupiter, still attended by his lover, now called Ganymede. Another version of the story has Zeus turning himself into that flying job recruitment agency, the Eagle. Zeus, of course, frequently, he frequently did that sort of thing in his straighter moments of desire. And he had many of those. Oh, yes. The constellations of Cygnus and Taurus representing two of these escapades and giving us a couple of bisexual star groups in the process. The former being the time he became a swan to visit Queen Leda of Sparta and the latter commemorating his transformation into a white bull to abduct Princess Europa of Canaan, who still keeps him company, like Ganymede, as a moon, making a, a celestial threesome, you could say, as they all journey together through the solar system. How romantic. On Ganymede, there are two craters named Gilgamesh and Enkidu. Now, they are characters in the world's oldest surviving piece of literature, the great Babylonian story, The Epic of Gilgamesh, preserved on clay tablets dating from the 3rd millennium BC. And that tells of the part mortal, part god, King Gilgamesh of Uruk, and his friend, the hero Enkidu, who he loved as a woman, taking him as he would a wife. But the king also had female lovers. He got around quite a bit. Gilgamesh was uh, actually based on a historical king who lived around 2700 BC, though the tablets recording his certainly rather embroidered exploits date from circa 2000 BC. This is the first recorded mention of a same-sex relationship, and since it is some 5,000 years old, it is perhaps the best answer to those who, who seem to think that homosexuality was invented during the 19th century by Oscar Wilde, as he strolled down Piccadilly in a lovely velvet suit wearing a green carnation in his buttonhole. How fitting that our fictional Babylonian lovers should be found together on a gay moon. On our own moon, the dark areas that produce the man in the moon effect are known as mare, from the Latin for sea, though there's no liquid uh, surface water on the moon. And these areas are really large plains composed of dry lava beds. They're easily visible in, in any binoculars. One of these is called the Mare Humboldtanium, or Humboldt's Sea. And that's named for the great German botanist, naturalist, zoologist, artist, and explorer Alexander von Humboldt, 1769 to 1859. A very famous gay man indeed. He explored the Orinoco and Amazon rivers uh, of South America and returned with an amazing 60,000 plant specimens, as well as making numerous astronomical uh, observations. You know, he, he explored and collected so much, in fact, that it, it took him over 20 years just to write an account of his travels. Among the named craters on the moon, we find quite a few gay names, actually, among them Zeno for the 5th century BC Greek philosopher Zeno of Elea, who you probably never heard of, I certainly hadn't, and da Vinci, for that amazing painter, inventor, musician, engineer, astronomer, and general, all-around amazing genius, Leonardo da Vinci, 1452 to 1519, who everyone has heard of, 
It was he, incidentally, who first suggested that the Maori might be water, and he may actually have invented an astronomical telescope of some kind, along with a great many other things, though no, no, no records of it survive, apart from a very vague reference in one of his diaries to something that would bring distant object close, which certainly sounds like a, a telescopic device of some kind. We also find the crater Julius Caesar, whose famous remark, I came, I saw, I conquered, applied not only to a number of countries, but to some of their rulers as well. Indeed, the bisexual Roman general, as a young man, acquired the nickname the Queen of Bithynia after a love affair with King Nicomedes IV of that country. Last but not least, we have that greatest of Athenian philosophers, Plato. Of course, the, the, the gayness of Plato, what came to be uh, known as Greek love, that wasn't exactly what we think of today as being gay, but it was far, far from what would be considered straight by our standards either. A man who never married and, and wrote of the perfection of homoerotic relationships, his famous symposium having been described as almost a manual for the pursuit of homoerotic spiritual paths even though at other times he actually spoke against the concept. While not wholly acceptable in many parts of Greece, among the armies and among the noble families in the city-states of Athens and Sparta, there was the mindset that you had sex with a woman just for fun or, or for children, you know, for, for keeping the species uh, reproducing. But for a genuine compatibility, for a bonding, a proper bonding between equals, well, you had to have sex with one who was your equal, and of course women weren't, so you, in other words, you had to have sex with a man. And it was so obvious it hardly needed saying. I mean, women were women were mere chattels. They didn't have rights or anything in, in, in ancient Greece. So you, you couldn't really consider a woman, you know, a, a sexual partner on your own level if you were a man. Oh, good heavens no. Yes. <clears throat> The moon was also the setting for a gay story, which I'm sure is also the first ever science fiction story as well. And it dates from the 2nd century AD, when the Greek satirist Lucian of Samosata wrote of a man who travelled to the moon, and he found there an all-male population, and he ended up taking the son of the moon king in marriage. No women. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there is a bit of a problem there. So if there were no women, how did the king have a son? Simple. They grew children from plants derived from planting a left testicle. How obvious. Why the left testicle and not the right one? I got no idea. Your guess is as good as mine. The planets, too, have their share of gay-named craters. The gayest planet of all being little Mercury, closest planet to the sun. On its baking hot surface, well over 400 degrees Celsius during the day, do not go there for a day trip, we find craters named for the ancient Greek playwright Sophocles, that well-known Italian decorator of ecclesiastical ceilings, Michelangelo, American poet Walt Whitman, French writer Marcel Proust, and the poet Arthur Rimbaud, Russian author Nikolai Gogol, bisexual British poet Lord Byron, and American nautical author Herman Melville of Moby Dick fame. The craters carry only the, the surnames, by the way. Now, Venus is the only female uh, planet, uh, and very appropriately, since it is named for the Roman goddess of love, we find on it the only women in our gay survey of the heavens. Firstly, there is the bisexual French writer Colette, best known for her novel Gigi. Then there is Sappho, the great Sappho, named for Sappho of Lesbos, who lived around 600 BC, the greatest lyric poet of the ancient world, referred to by Plato as the Tenth Muse, and history's first recorded lesbian. Indeed, it is from her Aegean island home of Lesbos that we actually get the term lesbian, which actually only means a resident of that island, just as a, a Dubliner is a resident of Dublin, a New Yorker is a resident of New York. It has no sexual connotation at all. And you could say, quite correctly, that every man, woman, and child on that island is a lesbian. There's a thought now. Her name has also given us the term sapphic love to describe a woman-to-woman -woman relationship. Unfortunately, the church authorities in Rome and Constantinople, with their usual ever-so-tolerant acceptance of other people's beliefs and desires, collected and burned all the copies of her work they could find in 1073 AD regarding love between women. So, 
Oh, a very dangerous poetic topic. Oh, yes, it could have unleashed moral disintegration across the known world. Think of it. A woman kissed a woman. Oh, 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 no. And unfortunately, they carried out their destructive prejudices so efficiently that only a few tiny fragments of her poems have survived. Completing our planetary tour, we come to the red planet Mars, where, though we won't find canals or little green men, gay or otherwise, we do find Leonardo da Vinci once again. Lying between Mars and Jupiter are thousands of small lumps of rock, known as the asteroids or the minor planets. And yes, yes, indeed, some of them are gay. Asteroid number 30 is Uranium, the muse of gayness, if you like, and number 80 is named for that extra muse, Sappho. 1036 is Ganymede, and 54 is Alexandra, which, despite its seemingly feminine form, is named for Alexander von Humboldt. Now, it's not, it's not a jibe at his sexuality, which you might think other asteroids are named in that very odd fashion as well, for some reason which totally escapes me. He died, actually, not long after his asteroid was discovered, so, so perhaps, the, perhaps the shock was too much for him, coming on top of all the years spent sorting out those 60,000 plants. Number 3,000 is Leonardo, in honour once again of the great Italian genius, while 3,001 is his fellow countryman, Michelangelo. Women, I'm afraid, are not well represented in the gay night sky, but astronomically minded lesbians might take note of the star Gamma Orionis, or Bellatrix, in the constellation of Orion, its proper name meaning female warrior, and it has become known as the Amazon star. The Amazons, that mythical race of warrior women who supposedly fought in the Trojan War, and who recent discoveries seem to indicate actually existed, graves of um, armoured women have been found buried with weapons, many with battle injuries, so it appears that these women, possibly Scythians, are the inspiration for the Greek uh, stories of the, uh, the Amazons. But the, the Amazons were armed with a double-bladed battle axe, which was known as the Labyrinth, and this has become a modern lesbian emblem. It's worn, for example, as an earring or a pendant, and I've seen one used as a car sticker. The Labyrinth was also the symbol of the Greek goddess of the harvest, Demeter, and lesbian sex, in fact, formed part of her worship rituals. So there is a gay female connection with the constellation of Virgo, which depicts uh, Demeter, uh, the goddess uh, shown in the sky holding an ear of wheat in her hand. The constellation of Lacerta, the lizard, was devised by Johannes Hevelke in the 17th century, but in 1787, the German astronomer Johann Ellert Bode used its stars for his own proposed constellation, Honoris Frederici, the Honours of Frederick, and that was dedicated to the greatest military genius and the most openly gay man of the age, King Frederick II of Prussia, 1712 to 1786, better known as Frederick the Great, or Friedrich de Grosse if you want it in German. As a young man, Prince Frederick was regularly beaten by his father, King Friedrich Wilhelm I, and forced to watch his lover executed, all in an attempt to cure his homosexuality. The treatment failed, however. And as king, just as gay as ever, he took Prussia from an unimportant little backwards country to the greatest military power on the continent, introduced many reforms, abolished torture, and brought in religious toleration, as well as encouraging the arts, though he tolerated no opposition to his authority. But he was a, a very fine king, and in fact, Napoleon, years later, having uh, conquered Berlin and standing at the tomb of King Frederick, turned to his generals and said, Gentlemen, if this man was still alive, I would not be standing here, which was quite a, a tribute uh, from, from him. Now, Herboda wasn't attempting to gain royal favours. Oh, no, no, no. He wasn't, he wasn't doing what we might call arse licking when he dedicated his constellation to Frederick. The king was in no position to grant any favours, since he happened to be dead at the time. The constellation didn't catch on, however, and the humble little lizard replaced the great gay king to take his place once again in the heavens, where it is today. Though representing that pair from Greek mythology, Castor and Polydeuces, or, or Pollux, the constellation of Gemini has also been seen as the biblical pair of, well, 
shall we say, more than just good friends, David and Jonathan. So you can see that as a, uh, as a gay constellation, if you wish. From Roman times, some of the stars that would later become Scutum, along with a number from Aquila, formed the constellation of Antinous. Now that was devised in the second century AD and dedicated to the handsome young man who was the lover of the gay Roman emperor, Caesar Tyrannus Hadrianus Augustus, better known to history as Hadrian of Scottish wall building fame. A genuinely caring and compassionate ruler who tried to improve the living standards of his subjects and cared for the welfare of his soldiers, which was a pretty rare thing among Roman emperors. Hadrian was touring the then Roman province of Egypt with Antinous when a fortune teller told him that one of the two would soon die. Hoping to save his beloved emperor by making the prophecy come true right there on the spot, Antinous, well, with probably more loving devotion than actual common sense, promptly threw himself into the Nile and he drowned. The devastated Hadrian mourned his lover for the rest of his life, surrounding himself with statues of the young man. But Initially, he named a city on the Nile in his honour, Antonopolis, declared Antinous a god, and ordered that his image be depicted among the stars. The real-life uh, relationship between Hadrian and Antinous had already been compared with the mythological one between Zeus and Ganymedes. The emperor was, of course, also considered to be a god. And for that reason, Antinous was placed in the sky below Ganymedes' raptrix, the eagle who carried um, Ganymedes uh, to Zeus on Mount Olympus and represented of course as carrying um, Ganymedes uh, or Gan uh, carrying Antinous I should say to Hadrian just as it had born Ganymedes. The mythological symbolism of course for that one was perfect mighty god and beautiful young lover. Some star maps continued to show Antinous until the late 18th century after which it was universally dropped. Now the constellation of Aquarius that represents our old friend Ganymedes, once again, depicted in the sky pouring liquid from a jar. Though the, the nature of the jar's contents, well, that depends on the version you choose. One has him pouring water for the benefit of the drought-stricken peoples of the earth, but for those who prefer a somewhat stronger brew, he is also seen in his role as bartender of Mount Olympus, pouring not water but gold and nectar and wine for the gods in general, and his lover Zeus in particular. That makes Aquarius the only constellation that still actually represents a, a gay person, though, as we have seen, others have done so in times gone by. Returning to Earth, we now take a look at a gay astronomer, Dr. Franklin E. Kameny. In 1959, Dr. Kameny, a Harvard-trained astronomer and World War II combat veteran, was fired from his job as an observation astronomer for the United States government, working with the Army Mapping Service, simply because, yes, he was gay. Now, this was long before even Don't Ask, Don't Tell came in. He then devoted his life to fighting for gay rights, believing that what he, or a straight person for that matter, did in the bedroom was nobody else's business but theirs. He organized the first gay pickets on the White House and other government buildings, he formed the Washington, D.C. chapter of the Mattachine Society, one of the very first gay rights groups, and he led the initial legal battles against the ban on gays serving in the U.S. armed forces. He continued to fight for gay rights into old age, dying in 2011 at the age of 86. Some of the best-known gay emblems are actually connected with astronomy. For example, that for a gay man is simply the astronomical symbol for Mars, doubled and overlapped, while the lesbian emblem is the overlapping double Venus symbol. The eleventh letter of the Greek alphabet, lambda, is used to donate the eleventh brightest star in a constellation from a system devised by Johann Bayer in 1603, but it is also a gay emblem, and it was first used in 1969 by the Gay Activist Alliance in New York. Perhaps we should leave the last word to Sappho of Lesbos, who, obviously alone in her bedroom some 2,600 years ago, made some astronomical observations, putting them into a poem, a little fragment of which survived the attentions of the medieval church. Tonight I've watched the moon, and then the Pleiades go down. The night is now half gone. Youth goes. I am in bed alone. 
So you see, astronomy isn't as straight as you thought it was. I hope you have been suitably educated and entertained at the same time. Goodbye for now.